From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro has proposed that early elections be held for the opposition-led National Assembly. During a rally of the, of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, President Nicolás Maduro made the announcement to try and find a way forward working with the opposition. Monday, May 20th, marks one year since President Nicolás Maduro was re-elected, with nearly 68% of the votes beating two opposition candidates. Since the election, the president survived an assassination attempt and the latest coup attempt, which took place on April 30th. Chavistas are also celebrating the, the country's triumph over the sabotage of the electrical system, the resilience of the people amid the financial blockade and theft of Venezuela's assets. Today I have a proposal on the 20th of May to the opposition. We're going to measure ourselves electorally. We're going to have elections. Let's legitimize the only institution which has been illegitimate during the last five years. Let's go to elections. Let's go to early elections for the National Assembly to see who has the support of the people, who has the votes, to see who wins. And during today's march, supporters celebrated the resiliency of the Bolivarian Revolution. Today we are celebrating one year of victory. Despite the blockade, despite the permanent blockade that they're waging against our people and these permanent attacks, here are the people resisting, saying to the world, we are here from the great transport mission with committed men and women in defense of the country, fulfilling the legacy of Hugo Chavez. We are here united, all of the institutions, all of the workers, the working class, the people, the men and women telling the Yankees to Trump, you won't succeed with us because here is a people full of men and women who defend our homeland, and today we celebrate with pride that on May 20th of 2018, we were exercising our right to vote, and today we ratify our commitment with President Nicolas Maduro, who has been there firm, defending the homeland. Our correspondent in Caracas, Luis Tavera, is on the ground at the march. Chavista supporters are marching to commemorate one year since the re-election of President Nicolás Maduro. They are also strongly rejecting and condemning the international actions to oust Maduro from government. The demonstration just started with social movements and civilians gathering to take part in this celebration. They are expected to march through downtown Caracas all the way to the Legislative Palace. Demonstrators say they will keep on supporting the government. In the face of attacks from the opposition that is supported by interventionist attempts by the United States. And uh, President Nicolás Maduro celebrated the anniversary on social media. He tweeted, quote, We celebrate the first anniversary for the popular victory of May 20th, a day in which Venezuelans decided in favor of peace, democracy, and freedom. Today is in this indissoluble civilian military union, we defend this sovereign victory with courage and bravery. Here it's the people who rule. Maduro also wrote, on one side we face aggressions, lies, persecutions and blockades of imperialism and on the other we work tirelessly to provide our people housing, health, education, employment, pensions, social security and political stability, heading towards communal socialism. Venezuelan citizens in Argentina are also suffering the effects of the blockade imposed by the United States on uh, their home country. They say the sanctions are putting at risk the lives of their sick children. The consequences of the Trump administration's economic sanctions cut through the borders of Latin America like missiles and the exploding part of Venezuelan families who are here in Argentina to treat their health problems. 
The blockade is not for the president. They are not hurting him. They are hurting us. They must stop this and unblock all the funds so that we can get the treatment we need. My daughter needs her post-transplant treatment. We have been fighting alongside her for 21 months. Her mother put herself at risk by donating her liver, and the blockade is making things impossible for us. That's why we ask them, we implore them, to lift the blockade and stop these attacks on the Venezuelan people. Douglas is overcome with pain and anxiety because he knows that his daughter's life is in danger and that other children have died because of the sanctions imposed by the United States. He says the actions of the Venezuelan opposition are inhumane. They say they want humanitarian aid for the Venezuelan people. But what they are doing is the opposite. They are taking away humanitarian help from the Venezuelan people. They don't care about the Venezuelan people because if they did, they wouldn't act like this. They are interfering with the resources of the people. It's not a political issue. We are not politicians. We are ordinary Venezuelans, human beings who need and demand what is our right, and they are taking it away from us. Jellybeth, Isabella's mother, says that without her help from the Venezuelan government, they cannot possibly afford the cost of the treatment. And they are begging the Venezuelan opposition not to make it a political issue. The children know nothing about politics. We are not involved in politics. We just want to save our children's life. We are asking them to put their hands on their heart. These are innocent children who are fighting for their lives. They are real fighters who have battled death. And we want to keep having them with us. We don't want all the efforts we have made to be in vain. The representative of Venezuela and Argentina, Juan Jose Valero, has blamed the government of Donald Trump and Mauricio Macri for what might happen to the children if they can't get treatment because of the blockade. It's an issue that goes beyond politics or ideology. It goes beyond the recognition of one government by another. Argentina, without realizing it, is complicit in one of the most serious crimes. This kind of crime goes directly against the human rights of these children. And this is what the United Nations classifies as crimes against humanity. And it is precisely because of those achievements of the Bolivarian Revolution that the Venezuelan people will continue to resist this ferocious blockade imposed by the empire. Moving on, the special jurisdiction for peace in Colombia says former FARC leader Jesus Santrich has not been extradited to the U.S. due to lack of evidence. In an official statement, the court says it does not have enough information to establish when Santrich would have committed the alleged drug trafficking crimes he is accused of by the U.S. Authorities have appealed the decision. Meanwhile, the FARC political party has rejected the judicial plot against Jesus Santrich. In an official statement, the party also rejected the role of the state in the killings of peace supporters and says it will take urgent actions to guarantee that peace agreements are fulfilled. On Saturday, the New York Times published an article on how the head of the Colombian army ordered his troops to double down on killings even at the risk of higher civilian casualties. Colombian Senator Ivan Cepeda spoke to Telesur and said this is a continuation of the deadly security policies implemented by former President Álvaro Uribe. What we have is an attempt to resurface all criminal practices against human rights. The main object here is to design policies and legal instruments to allow members of military forces to murder people in order to fulfill a series of requirements and reach a specific number of murders and prepare a report for their higher officials. We need to completely eradicate these criminal acts from the history of the military forces of Colombia. If it is a part of the doctrine that any measure is violated to obtain results, it is obvious that they are going to present formal results by murdering social leaders and civilians. These policies are not only within the framework of our operations against criminal organizations, but also promotes other forms of violence, such as the murdering of social leaders. And after the, uh, the article was published, the Minister of Defense, Guillermo Botero, tried to defend the actions of the army. After the inaccuracies published in an article during the weekend, I will say that the main point to clarify to the public opinion is that according to a decree of the Colombian Constitution of 2011, the defense of the people's rights is to face the aggressors. This
This is the purpose of the Colombian military forces. The aggressor needs to be under control. People that vulnerate the law must face justice, and we do it based on our Constitution and the Supreme Court of Justice. I repeat what I said many times on August 7, 2018. President Ivan Duque asked me to observe the law, the Constitution and the human rights, and I have repeated this many times to commanders, and they have also reiterated it to their members. And also responding to the article, a lawyer's association denounced the selective assassination policies of the armed forces. The Jose Alvear Restrepo organization said that the same situation led to the murder of thousands of young people from 2002 until 2010. They said the orders given by the army authorities place innocent civilians at risk. And a Colombian feminist activist was attacked while inside a car in Barranquilla. She had previously denounced death threats against her for her work with the victims of the armed conflict. Mayerlis Angarita works with a group of hundreds of women after the peace agreement was signed. She was traveling with her children and a nephew on Saturday when an armed man approached the car and shot at her. Police said they were investigating the incident. And yet another underage migrant has died while in the custody of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. In an official statement shared on social media, the agency says a 16-year-old Guatemalan boy passed away early on Monday at the Weslaco station in the Rio Grande Valley. The cause of the death is still unknown. The boy had reportedly been apprehended on May 13th near Hidalgo, Texas, for illegal entry into the country. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Ahead of October's election, the Bolivian people ratified their support for President Evo Morales during the massive launch of his movement towards socialism campaign. At least 500,000 people from around the country met at the Chimore Airport in Cochabamba to support the Morales Garcia Linera ticket. Morales called the demonstration historical. It was attended by social movements, unions, workers, campesinos, teachers, and others who have expressed their loyalty to the transformation process says that began in Bolivia in 2006. Barbados has reached a staff level agreement with the IMF after the island passed its first review from the Washington based organization. The agreement is subject to approval by the IMF in June, after which the island could receive a $49 million disbursement. This will bring the total money borrowed under the Extended Fund Facility Program to almost $98 million. Last year, Barbados entered into a $290 million IMF deal. Barbados continues to make strong progress in implementing its ambitious and comprehensive economic reform program. International reserves, which had reached a low of 220 million US dollars, uh, five or six weeks of import coverage at end May 2018, have more than doubled since then. And the completion of the domestic part of the debt restructuring has been very helpful in reducing economic uncertainty. And the new terms agreed with creditors have put debt on a clear downward trajectory. Well, we continue to have to stabilize our revenue. We're pretty much there with what we want. I mean, I announced in the budget a number of changes. We have to give them time to come out. Um, we have some other structural changes. A lot of it is legislative. Um, if you're asking for major layoffs, no. Um, there obviously are still some that are cleaning up in some state-owned enterprises, but nowhere near what you saw last year. That is behind us. Moving on, on Saturday, the 64th edition of the Eurovision Festival was held in Israel with the participation of guest artists such as Madonna. At the same time, an event called Global Vision was held to oppose the fact that Israel was the headquarters of Eurovision 2019 and show solidarity with the Palestinian people. From the United Kingdom, Pablo Navarrete with the details. Are you ready? This Saturday in Tel Aviv, Israel, the 64th edition of the Eurovision Song Contest took place amidst controversy. Despite calls for a boycott to the event by Palestinian civil society, different European countries sent competitors, and Madonna was reportedly paid $1 million to perform. 
but another event, Global Vision, was held in parallel to Eurovision with the aim of denouncing Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories. Taking place in the cities of Bethlehem and Haifa, events also took place in Ireland and London as well. So Global Vision is a way of saying, don't be complicit, don't be part of uh, Eurovision. Here's an opportunity to come, have a good evening, listen to some fantastic music, listen to some artists who are putting principles first, but at the same time, make a political point that we will not be complicit with what Israel is doing. From a special studio in London, music was live broadcast on the internet for four hours on Saturday night while Eurovision was airing on TV. And the concert in London was attended by around 500 people and featured Palestinian and British artists. The British musician Brian Eno was a high-profile supporter of Global Vision and responded to the accusations by the Israeli government and others who have denounced what they say is a politicization of a cultural event such as Eurovision. I would rather live in a world where culture wasn't being used as a weapon. But the fact is, we are in that world. It is being used as a weapon. Um, and quite consciously by the Israelis, I think. So I think it's quite hypocritical of them to say, oh, don't use culture as a weapon. You know, it's not a coincidence that they're paying artists a million dollars for a show. Global Vision's organizers say that more than 40,000 people watched their live stream broadcast on Saturday, with more than 50 artists contributing songs for the project. There was even a Global Vision event in Bethlehem's Ada refugee camp, the most tear gas placed on earth, where two thirds of residents are under the age of 18. With the success of Global Vision, it has once again been shown how culture plays a role in the resistance to Israel's occupation and its attacks against the Palestinian people. Pablo Navaretti, Telesur, London. And now to Africa, where the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo has appointed Sylvester Ilunga Ilunkamba as prime minister. Ilunga's nomination was announced just an hour after the former prime minister, who served under Kabila administration, handed in his resignation. The incoming prime minister previously served as a minister and financial advisor to the presidency since 1981. I consider my appointment to be a heavy responsibility at this crucial time in the history of our country. I pledge to mobilize all my capacities to make the coalition work harmoniously at a government level. The World Health Organization chief has urged different political factions in the Democratic Republic of Congo to unite in the battle against Ebola. The organization has warned that the risk of spread remains very high. Nearly 1,200 people have died since last August when the DRC celebrated a 10th outbreak of Ebola in the country in 40 years. Efforts to roll back the outbreak have been hampered by fighting in the affected regions and attacks on medical teams. Unless we unite to end this outbreak, we run the very risk that it will become more widespread and more expensive and more aggressive. South Africa's former president Jacob Zuma has returned to court to face corruption charges. Zuma faces 16 counts of fraud, racketeering and money laundering. The charges relate to a weapon deal that the South African government signed in 1999 with the French manufacturer Talese. Zuma's legal team claimed the charges are a politically motivated witch hunt against the former president. We think the National Prosecuting Authority subscribes to in the manner in which they have dealt with Mr. Zuma. I called it the mob justice. It's, it's driven and inspired by something all of us in this room have, to, to varying degrees. It's bias. Hundreds of African National Congress members gathered outside the court to show solidarity to Zuma. The supporters brought traffic to a standstill at various roads near the courts were closed. They say songs are praising Suma's role in the party and uh, the struggle against apartheid. They claim that Suma is being persecuted by what they refer to as his political enemies. I believe that Comrade Zuma is faced with a very unfair situation where this trial has dragged on for one and a half decades, where there has been political interference and at the same time also a very poisoned public climate which has been created by a lot of negative media reporting. 
under those circumstances, in Contui Sizwe Military Veterans Association, questions whether it is possible for Comrade Jacob Zuma to truly get a free and fair trial. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Palestinian Authority has said the U.S. government did not consult them regarding a U.S.-led conference in Iran next month designed to encourage investment in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The White House announced the conference on Sunday. They said the conference is part of President Donald Trump's so-called deal of the century. The PA have, however, said any solution that does not address Palestinian people's core demands for an end to Israel's occupation will not work. Cabinet stresses that it wasn't consulted about the reported workshop, neither about the content nor the outcome and or the timing. It clarifies that the financial crisis that the Palestinian National Authority is living through today is a result of the financial war that is being waged against us in order to win political consensus. We do not submit to blackmail and we don't trade our political rights for money. Our correspondent Nayara Tardo has the details. Palestine's Prime Minister says the Palestinian Authority was not approached regarding the summit organized by the United States, which is set to take place at the end of June in Bahrain, regarding investments in the West Bank and the Gaza border. The goal of the conference is to attract investors from the Arab countries to develop infrastructure in Palestine and the occupied territories as well. U.S. officials said the conference will not focus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the border between territories or the issues surrounding Jerusalem and the Palestinian refugees. They said they will, however, address what they call the deal of the century, which aims to designate Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and annex the West Bank to the country and to deny Palestinians their right to return to their lands. Palestinian officials also denounced the U.S. attempt to give Palestine big sums of money and investments so they will stop asking for a Palestinian state. They say that is one of the main objectives of this coming conference. Meanwhile, the demolition of Palestinian homes continues, which are then replaced with Israel Israeli settlements. We thank Nayara Tardo for that report. 47 migrants who have been stranded on the Mediterranean Sea for days have disembarked on the Italian island of Lampedusa, despite threats from Interior Minister. He, in a televised speech earlier on, uh, Sal uh, on, Salvini had vowed to make sure that the ship operated by German charity organization Sea Watch does not dock in any of their ports. However, a magistrate gave an order to the port and immigration authorities to allow the migrants to disembark. Mark. The U.S. Embassy in Uganda has announced it is aware of reports of a U.S. pastor who is distributing an extremely dangerous substance said to be a miracle cure to people. The substance is said to actually be a solution made up of industrial bleach, with the pastor reportedly claiming that the toxic fluid irritates cancer, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and most other diseases. The solution was being given to infants as young as 14 months old. The chief of Algeria's armed forces has called for a speedier, speedier information of a committee to supervise alongside presidential elections without mentioning a date for the vote. Lieutenant General Ahmed Gaed Salah says elections are the best way to overcome the country's ongoing political crisis and to avoid a constitutional vacuum. A presidential election had previously been scheduled for July 4th. And with that, sir, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.